now that you've been given the objectives for, for this week's lesson, let's get into reading the story. Blood Brothers, John Wickham. The sun was boiling hot and the house was stifling him. So Paul took his pencils and his watercolors and went to sit under the Casarina trees. The air was still and it shimmered in the noonday heat and Paul felt sleepy. But he fought against the sleep and, gripping the pencil in his fingers, set about the sketch he was about to make. The picture he wanted to paint he could see in his mind more clearly than with his eyes. For all of his 13 years, he had seen things he was seeing now and they were etched in his memory. An indestructible part of him, indivisible from himself and his own thoughts, a part of him that not even his twin brother Benji and his insufferable complex of superiority could destroy. The long grass bent in the wind, the hibiscus flowers shone violent red in the sunlight, and the casserina swayed and spoke in sibilant whispers. It was cool under the casserinas, and Paul stuck the pencil in his mouth and, lying flat on his back, looked up through the gossamer lace work of the tree's foliage to the sky. Funny, thought Paul, that in the daylight, Casarina trees could be so tall and graceful and slender and lovely, swaying in the wind and bending, whispering ever so languidly, like lovely ladies in pictures. And yet at night, by starlight and moonlight, they assumed such fantastic, frightening ghost-like shapes. Casarinas at night. Paul shuddered at the memory. He and Benji had set out for a walk with their father after dinner one night. Paul remembered, even now, after six or seven years, that the moon was rising when they left home, and Benji had been even in gayer spirits than usual. He had just discovered that he could whistle. Paul remembered too that Benji's laugh had mocked him because he had not yet learned to whistle. And he had been silent at this added proof of his brother's superiority. He hated Benji for this small triumph and for his sneering contemptuous way of being able to do everything better than he for treating him with his air of studied disdain, as if he were a little girl who had to be helped over fences, who wasn't expected to climb trees and bring down birds with catapults, and who, had, and who would burst into tears for nothing that he, Benji, could understand. Paul remembered that. When they had turned into Garnet Road, the Casarina shadows were lying across the road in fantastic shapes, delicate shadow, diffuse in the soft light, weird and macabre, and the wind was whispering thinly through the trees with the unearthly voice of a ghost. The whole picture was faintly lit by the spectral light of the moon slanting through the trees, and he had been afraid. He had clutched his father's hand and his father had, it seemed, understood that he was afraid and had squeezed his hand in reassurance. Only Benji, unaware and unafraid, hopped and danced along the road, exploiting his newly discovered whistle and flaunting his own complete lack of fear, his own blatant intrepidity in the face of the wrath-like shadows and the ghostly voices of the trees. As Paul pieced together the memory of long ago, his heart filled with a full-blooded hate for his blood brother. Paul looked up through the trees at the sky and knew that in Benji's eyes, he was a coward. 
It was no solace to his wounded spirit to know that Benji had never called him a coward. His brother's own lack of fear, his recklessness, and his arrant devil maker swagger was to him an unspoken insinuation of his own cowardice, and he felt the stigma of his own timidity each time Benji and he played together. His self-contempt and distaste for his own chicken-heartedness, implicit in his slavish, albeit unwilling, hero worship of his twin brother. Paul hated Benji with a bitter, passionate venom. And with all his heart's fierceness, he hated and despised himself for hating him. In quiet moments, as now, alone with himself, staring up at the blue pool of the sky or sketching on the hill with the wind in his ears, it was easy for him to love his brother as himself. When he rose early in the morning and walked through the dew wet grass to his spot on the hill, he wished that Benji could be with him. He would like to talk to him, to tell him that he really wasn't a coward, that there were all sorts of queer little things, little goings on inside him, that he knew the way the blue mist on the green hills, the way of the white pigeons flying in joyous circles around the house. He yearned with every fiber of him, with a fervor not damped by these many years of vain wishing to share with Benji the secret ways of his heart. He wanted to link arms with Benji, to tap from his limitless reservoir of courage, some measure of it for himself, so that the two of them could walk together as one. He yearned for this so deeply that he was afraid Afraid that Benji, the little man, so universally applauded for his daring, so consistent in his acts of heroism, climbing to the top of the tamarind tree, careless whether he fell, daring to crawl under the house to search for the hen's eggs in the darkness, breaking his arm and betraying not so much as a wince when the doctor at the hospital said it, afraid that Benji would reject his offer and interpret his overture as, an, as another proof of his cowardice. Paul hugged his secrets close and retired into himself. His thoughts buried so deep inside him that they turned sour and the germ of his potential love turned bitter hate. Sometimes the violence of his hate frightened Paul and he trembled, unable to contain within his frail body the seething tumult of his inner conflict. The love he bore his brother, the admiration he had for his popularity and the twinkling smile in his eye contending in his heart with his own envy, the timid sense of his own timid spirit and his own tongue-tied shyness. And out of the turmoil inside him, there sprouted his own violent hate, deep and morbid, because it was rooted and nurtured in the fertile composed heap of his own unavowed love. And always, Paul hated Benji's presence for reminding him of the night of the ghost, the shadows, and the thin whisper of the Casarinas. Benji sauntered through the back gate, his teeth biting deep into a piece of bread. Paul guessed that he had rifled the larder. For Benji, it seemed to him, would do that and glory in the doing. Benji swaggered past Paul lying on his back under the trees in an exaggerated goose step of triumph, secure and unassailable in the citadel of his own good humor and blithe spirit, 
never dreaming that there could be anyone in the whole wide world who did not wish him well and caring less than a row of pins for anyone who wished him evil. Paul's hate grew big. Look at him, he said to himself, strutting like a cock. He knows I'm watching him. He's only pretending that he doesn't care. Benji sat under the tamarind tree and finished his bread. When he had finished, he got up and began throwing stones idly across the pasture. He grew tired of this and after a short while, and Paul's eyes were on him when he tossed his head in defiance of his boredom that was setting in. He called out to Paul. See who came through the farthest, he shouted. No, Paul answered back. His voice was abrupt and held no hint of the longing in his heart to share games with Benji. And besides, he went on in an effort to prove himself superior. It's farther. <laughs> the hint was to Benji, like water off a duck's back. He ignored it and started to climb the tamarind tree. Let's play Tarzan, he invited, letting out the, uh, the ape man's blood-curling yell. Paul did not bother to answer. He sat brooding on his brother, and his hate flooded through his body, and the blood pounded in his ears. Let's go over to Mac, he suggested. Undeterred and with the, his sunniest smile, in spite of Paul's refusals, and Paul, because in the end, Benji always made him do what he wanted, subjected his will and walked along with Benji. Mac was the old shoemaker in the village and his shop was the meeting place of the boys during the holidays. Today, the shop was empty except for Mac, who was sitting on his little bench at the door, stitching a shoe. The twins strolled into the tumble down shop. Hello, Mac said Benji, and went through the back door to the guava tree in the yard. Hello, Mac, said Paul, and took a seat on the floor behind the shoemaker's back. Hello, boys, said Mac, and went on with his stitching. Paul picked up one of Mac's awls and began making holes in an old piece of leather he found on the floor. Benji, out in the yard, was tearing off the bark of the guava tree with his teeth and pretending he was a wild animal. A few minutes passed. Then Benji shouted, Come and play, Paul! But Paul did not answer. He only sat idly, punching holes in the piece of leather with the sharp awl. Benji strolled back into the shop. Paul felt him enter, but didn't look up. He just went on pushing the awl through the leather, the, the leather and pulling it out again. Benji walked across to him and touched him on his shoulder. Oh, come and play, he pleaded. At the touch of his brother's hand, Paul's blood surged within him and all the pent-up hate and fear and envy and all the accumulated jealousy and worship of the years flooded through him. His blood was hot inside him and he was blind with anger. He dropped the piece of leather from his hand and with one violent push, hurled Benji into the corner and ran across the room and stood over him, the all poised in his right hand for a swift, murderous blow. Then he saw the look of incomprehension on his brother's face, the look of, why, what have I done? The look of puzzlement and surprise. And he saw the wide-eyed look of horror and fear in Benji's eyes. The awl dropped from Paul's hand and he turned away. Mac had not even looked up. So sure he was, so sure was he that the boys were playing 
So swiftly had the action moved. Paul passed Mac at his little bench and walked silently home, trembling and confused and frightened by the violence of his action, but purged of hate and happy in the discovery that his brother also knew fair. This story, ladies, is just remarkable. Can you imagine your twin brother, your twin, the same womb, the same egg splitting too, actually tried to murder him? But he didn't go through with the action because he saw the fear in his brother's eyes. And that gave him some solace to know that, yes, my brother too can feel fear. You see, ladies, Paul was jealous of his brother Benji because Benji showed no fear of anything. Benji was a happy-go-lucky extroverted child. Paul was an introvert, so Paul kept everything to himself. Further up in the story, Paul said that he would love to talk to Benji, to share what he thought with Benji, but then he always backtracked because he thought that Benji would think of him as a girl. Benji would think that he, Paul, was unable to do everything like he, Benji. Paul was jealous that Benji could whistle and that he could not. Benji did not care. That's what Paul thought. Benji didn't even think as we read in the story, that anybody would wish him evil. Benji just went about his day, climbing trees, wanting to play, wanting to be a child. Paul, though, more mature in his thinking, even though they're the same age. He thought more of everything. He overthought everything. And so it made him hate his blood brother. It's sort of like Cain and Abel. Remember those two from the Bible? So right there we kind of have a biblical illusion even though Cain killed Abel. It would have been the same in this story had Paul not stopped when he saw that fear in his brother's eyes. So we know what a biblical illusion is, don't we? Well, if we don't know, let me do a recap for you. A biblical illusion is when you take events from the Bible and you compare them with literal with literal information so for example we are referring to the story blood brothers and paul's action towards benji is a bit synonymous with cain's action towards abel the hate for his brother thinking that his brother is the favorite the perfect one and he now is not I hope that cleared it up a bit. But in the event that you don't fully understand biblical illusion, you will be taught it further in poetry class. Now, ladies, I want you to understand that this story, the vocabulary is wide. The vocabulary is sometimes even bigger than me. I'm not going to lie. But you will be provided with a vocabulary list in order to help you to understand how the story goes. You are also going to be provided with a copy of the story in your Google Classroom. Ladies, this tutorial is only day one of this lesson. Please enjoy the rest of your week.